around a little bit and you never quite figure out where you're going to land. Some people till their 30s, you know, <laughs> 25, 30, whatever later. You figure out where your niche is, you know, and sometimes you never really do. You're just kind of, but you know, it's not going to be that way when we stand before the Lord. We're not going to kind of bounce around and try to figure out where we're at and, uh, you know, for the, for the first thousand years, you know, and then kind of land on Mars or Jupiter or wherever it is that we're, you know, going to be serving the Lord. <laughs> the work is done, and God is going to give us a position, a responsibility based on the... Um, uh, on the accumulated maturity, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and your capacity for service. And, and, and you're, you're going to demonstrate your capacity, your maturity, your experience, and God is going to give us a position, a, the reward. I'm, I'm kind of actually going into the, the next. But see, the judgment seat of Christ is us preparing, is, is, us, is the review as we are preparing for the life that is to come. Because that's what's really going to matter. This is, just, you know, our, our 70 years, 80, by, excuse me, by meson of strength, um, is preparing us for that. And so we live our life in view of eternity, don't we? And the, the judgment seat of Christ is the review. So we're talking about those, those types of things. We're going to be talking about this morning, the, this morning, and my, my battery is out. The, the, we're going to be talking about this morning again the issue of gold and silver and precious stones. Um, it's kind of the, 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 the extension of that. We began that some with, with last week. Um, so um, here we go. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. We're going through this passage about the work and the review. Verse 9 and 10. For we are labors together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Father, thank you this morning for the opportunity to look into your word, for us to consider these things. Um, the, the issue of our service for you. For Father, we, 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 are to, our, our, we, we labor that we might be accepted, not eternally, but that our service might meet with your approval and your, your, your pleasing. We know that you're pleased with, with all that are in your Son. He's the foundation. And uh, when we stand in him, we stand accepted in the Beloved. But our service, Father, matters. The mission and the job that you've given us to do here for you matters. And so that as we consider these things, Lord, we, uh, we just pray that you'd encourage us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The issue of our service, Paul's gospel is the standard of our service. He says we're laborers according to the grace of God give, which is given unto me. We looked at that phrase, how the grace of God given to Paul is his salvation, but it's also the content of the message that was given to him. And the analogy of building a building, the blueprints, God is building a temple. If you look at verse number 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The analogy, the figure of speech of building a building. He says the same thing in verse 9. We're labors together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. The body of Christ is a place where God dwells and desires to man manifest himself, just like that Old Testament temple in the days of Solomon. And Solomon received a blueprint from his father, David. A blueprint in writing. We actually saw that. And David prepares everything. Gold for the things of gold and, and silver for the things of silver and precious stones. We're going to look at a couple of those things. Now, I suggested to you last week, and I think this is, this is a way to look at it. Um, he says in verse, uh, verse 11, Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation of this building. And then we build upon it. He says, now if any man, verse 12, build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Um, there's the materials. And I just noticed something today. You know, 
Sometimes we read those verses, there's no or and there's no and in that list of six things. Sometimes, for, for a long time, I thought, well, it, your life can either be gold or it can be silver or it can be precious stones. But there's no gold or silver or precious stones or gold and silver and precious stones. It's, it's all three, and I think we need all three of those in our life. It's not talking about level. He's talking about the totality of what needs to be built in our lives according to the grace that was given to the Apostle Paul. Now, just a bit of review. How many metals are there there? Gold, silver, precious stones. Why are there three? Why not two? Why not one? Why not four? Why not five? What is the number three in the Bible? The Trinity. I think the gold represents God the Father. The silver represents God the Son. And the precious stones represent God the Holy Spirit. I'm going to try to show you a little more why I believe that. Now, whether or not that's the case, or Paul is just making a figure of speech in a general way, but there's something about that. When you think about the Trinity and God the Father, as Paul presents him, and God the Son, as the Apostle Paul presents him, and God the Holy Spirit, as God presents them, there's a correlation with gold, silver, and precious stones. So I'm going to try to present that, those, build upon those things with you. Right division, though, is important. It's vitally important because we see this gold, silver, precious stone. God the Father, well, God the Father, gold, okay? Gold. The gold is for a king. But gold is also associated with that temple back in the Old Testament. All the, the temple was highlighted with gold. Even the wood, the, 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 the combustible, <laughs> uh, corruptible element of wood, you know, when there was wood the offer in the, you know, the tabernacle and the, the, you know, the, the, the ark and the staves and the, you know, the, the altar of incense and all that was always covered with gold. The, 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 the wood was inside the gold. <laughs> God, gold is also deity in the Bible. It's for a king. It's also deity. And when we think about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead have an element in the execution of God's plan and God's purpose in a new way with the Apostle Paul. Um, God the Father, the gold here. Go back to, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. And, you know, sometimes we just gloss over the Trinity. But if you categorize and you think about what, when Paul refers to God the Father, and then what, what he says about God the Father, and then what he says about God the Son, and then what he says about the Holy Spirit, you'll recognize that the, that the Trinity, each member of the Trinity, has a role in the execution of God's will and God's plan. 1 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ through what the will of God what you see as you read Paul's epistles especially in the prison epistles Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians the full the fuller development of God's revelation God the Father had the plan it was the purpose according to the good counsel of his will. The purpose that he had in Christ Jesus before the, before the foundation of the world. God the Father is the, is the architect of the plan. Now he, he developed that plan with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. But you see the will of God. The overall plan. The overall purpose there. God is the designer he is, the, he is the, 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 the architect. Paul talks about the grace of God that was given to me. The plan and the purpose and the outline of God. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. 
It's God's testimony. Paul was an apostle by the will of God according to the commandment of God. It was the, it was the, the, the plan that God developed way back before the foundation of the world. There's something interesting about that. When you think about God the Father and the issue of the gold, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Howbeit, Paul says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of who? God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the foundation of the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God had, the, God had this plan. God had this hidden wisdom. Did he have wisdom that he had revealed previously? He'd had the prophetic wisdom, the book of Proverbs, Solomon, that men might know wisdom and knowledge and instruction. God had some wisdom that he revealed in the scripture that he had spoken. But here Paul says God had some hidden wisdom which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God had an element of his plan that he kept secret, that he didn't reveal because it was going to reveal and make known some hidden wisdom that uh, uh, enabled him to demonstrate his worthiness to be trusted. Because if he'd have let the cat out of the bag... If he'd have revealed this part of his plan, he has the ability to say, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because what's the great, what's the great stroke of God's wisdom? The cross. And, and here's God the Son. Here's the silver. You know, the Father lays out this plan. Here's my, here's my plan from before the foundation of the world. I have some things prepared for the, 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 the saints, the glory of the church, the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ says, yep, I'll step out and I'll do what's necessary to make that plan and to accomplish that plan. I'll go do what needs to be done according to that plan. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about the faith of Jesus Christ, right? And it says in Philippians that, that he humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient to what? Obedient to the plan. And he walked by faith and he accomplished the plan. He came and he executed the things that were going to make that plan come to fruition. And then you have God the Holy Spirit, too, that's involved in, in the execution of the plan. But here, here's, this, here's this plan. He had a hidden, God had a hidden mystery plan that he didn't reveal. That had to do with some glory that he had prepared for the body of Christ. Some things prepared for them that love him. Get two passages. Get Matthew chapter number 25. Let me show you the contrast here. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And Ephesians chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And Matthew chapter 25. God had a plan. Did God have a plan that he revealed and that he spoke since the foundation of the world? Prophecy. We, we, use, we quote those verses all the time. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Verse 31, here's the goal, here's the climax of the plan. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall, the, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations and so on. There's the, the second coming and the judgment of the nations. Look at verse 34. Then shall the King say unto them on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you, how long? From the foundation of the world. God was preparing a kingdom 
for the earth and, and the purpose that's going to be it's going to climax in the second coming with the nation of Israel and the earth and he's going to restore the earth right and that's been prepared since the foundation of the world I heard something on the way to church this morning I'll share it with you the guy that comes on the radio after us he was talking about John 14 where the Lord says let not your heart be troubled um, believe in God believe also in me I go to prepare a place for you and the guy said yeah and when he's done preparing that place he's going to come back for us and I'm thinking you know I, that's Richard's favorite phrase by the way um, I, you know I was thinking <laughs> you ought to think <laughs> the God of heaven and earth that spoke the universe into existence in six days is preparing a place for us and he's still not done you know what when the Lord says I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house you know what's being prepared a kingdom that's not quite done yet because there's some things that, that, that have to be accomplished he's forming the little flock he's got to put down all rule, authority and power and, and the second coming of Christ everything's ready and that kingdom has been prepared and now people can inherit it at the second coming of Christ and he's spoken that purpose since the foundation of the world and where does that who does that purpose really focus on it focuses on God being glorified in His Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is the object. He is the, he is the accomplisher. He is the redeemer. He's the deliverer of Israel. He's the silver. We'll get to that in a minute. And it all focuses on God being glorified in the earth through the Lord Jesus Christ, preparing and then having a kingdom, a literal physical kingdom on the earth prepared and he's spoken that since the world began and Jesus Christ comes fulfilling the promises made unto the fathers doesn't he say over and over again that it might be fulfilled that it might be fulfilled that it might be fulfilled and Jesus Christ is going to come and fulfill all of that but look at Ephesians chapter number 3 Ephesians chapter number 3 and verses 8 and 9 Paul says you know, according to the grace given unto him, verse 2, the dispensation, the message that was given unto him as a wise master builder, verse 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know why it's unsearchable? Because you can't find it. It's not back there. It's not part of what God had been speaking since the world began. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid. Where? In God. God had this mystery plan and where was it hidden? It wasn't hid back in the Old Testament it wasn't hidden back there because if he revealed it the princes of this world would have figured it out they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory <laughs> where was it? it was hid in God he had the plan it was his verse number 11 according to the eternal purpose his eternal purpose he says in Ephesians 1 his eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus the Lord and chapter 1 says that purpose was before the foundation of the world he calls it up in verse um, 3 how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of who Christ there's the son this hidden plan that God devised was his plan it de demonstrated his hidden wisdom but where was that hidden wisdom going to be demonstrated it was going to be demonstrated in his son and his son had a purpose verse 5 which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Hey, there's the Spirit. You see how the Trinity has, they're, they're all involved in this process? 
It's really neat when you think about it. Now, the thing about gold and silver and precious stones, I think that gold represents the God the Father and His will and His plan. Gold speak, in the Bible speaks of deity. It's the ultimate metal, the ultimate metal of value. Silver. You know what silver is in the Bible? Silver is money. It's capital. It's the purchasing capital over and over and over again. Some examples. Abraham paid 400 shekels of silver in Genesis to buy a plot of ground to bury Sarah in. Joseph, when he was sold by his brothers, he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was betrayed by Judas, inflation, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Over and over and over again, you see this element of silver in the Bible. Um, um, uh, uh, Joseph gave Benjamin, remember that, that di the, the, the thing back and forth between the brothers? as they're coming back and forth and Joseph hasn't made known himself, gave Benjamin 300 pieces of silver. 300 pieces, you know what that was? Coins. It was money. It was purchasing. When a man's ox gored a servant, and you know what he was responsible to do? He was responsible to pay silver to the owner of the, the servant that had been killed by the ox. Just over and over and over again. Silver in the Bible... Is, is, is money. It's purchase currency. Silver is redemption money. <laughs> redemption. What is redemption? Redemption is paying a price. And isn't Jesus Christ the Redeemer? <laughs> you are, he says in Corinthians, you are bought with a price. It's the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in Him we have redemption through His blood. The, the, the silver is redemption money. It's purchase money. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Redeemer. Is He the Redeemer for the nation of Israel? Did He give His life a ransom for many? You know, well, eventually for all to be testified in due time. My point is. Did God have a plan for the nation of Israel that he revealed? Did God have a plan for the body of Christ? That was a secret plan. But now that plan centered in his son. And what did his son have to do to, uh, to fulfill that plan for the nation of Israel? He had to come and what did he have to do? Give his life a ransom for many. He was the Passover lamb. The, the liberator. He was the Pentecostal pourer out of the, of the, of the spiritual blessing. He was the, he was the propitiation. He was the, he was the goat that was killed, the, the, the propitiation on the Day of Atonement. Typology, I'm just saying. Jesus Christ, his, his will, His obedience to come and be the Redeemer and his cross work and his, his faithfulness to execute the plan as he the father had the plan and Jesus Christ came and that plan all centered in his cross work and the blood of that new covenant that he shed for the nation of Israel was the, was the, 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 the val it was the redemption money it was the silver he was the deliverer he was the deliverer there was a goal to accomplish for in that in that program and he is our redeemer too is he not he gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in the due, in due time in whom we have redemption through his blood you know sometimes we separate things but the cross is the great is the great hinge on which both programs flow and execute and jesus christ the the, the issue of silver and the Redeemer, and the redeem re Redeemer, and the, the Deliverer. And God had a goal to accomplish, and Jesus Christ came and did what was necessary to accomplish that goal. And he had a role to fill. He was the head, he was the, 
the Messiah, the Deliverer, the King of Israel, and ultimately going to be glorified in the earth because of his cross work, because of what he accomplished there. And he's also the Redeemer for us, isn't he? And his cross work now is expanded and opened up in an unprophesied way, isn't it? That now he gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time through the grace that was given to the Apostle Paul. Paul reveals the plan of God the Father and reveals the work and the obedience of God the Son in his cross work. Go to Colossians. You're here. Colossians chapter number 1. Now the cross is the payment for our sins. But it is, and, and I'm not trying to minimize that in any way, shape, or form. But the cross accomplishes so much more in the bigger picture of what God was seeking to do. It's the hidden wisdom, Christ crucified, the hidden wisdom, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Look at what the cross does. Look at what Jesus Christ as the Redeemer, as the Liberator does. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Verse 20 is a battleground verse for the doctrine of universal reconciliation. The, the idea that God was gonna, is going to save somehow and reconcile all people, even the lost. The, con the context here is not talking about the redemption of people the reconciliation of people. People are talked about down there in, in verse 21. And you have, were sometimes enemies are alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works that now have he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. There's the reconciliation of the people. You know what verse 20 is talking about? It's talking about positions of rank and authority in heaven and earth up in verse 16 and 17 and 18. The things in heaven are thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. Visible and invisible. You know, what, you know what the cross does in the expanded work of the Redeemer? It was the great stroke by which God was going to redeem some people that could restore under His authority, leadership, and design the earth but also the heavenly places too the cross is a marvelous expression of God's wisdom and his power to restore the universe and you know what this hidden wisdom does it says God was going to do it in the heavens too <laughs> and the cross is this great stroke of power he goes over in chapter 2 of Colossians verse 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us and contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross takes the law out of the way and establishes his righteousness in a new way verse 15 and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. In what? In his cross. It's the great stroke by which God is going to take back to himself his universe that was usurped and taken over by the prince of the power of the air. God the Father had the plan. He lays out the plan. God the Son says, yes, I will do, I will walk and fulfill and do what's necessary to make that plan happen. The plan for the nation of Israel that had been spoken and the, the mystery of Christ and a new hidden aspect of that plan, Jesus Christ accomplished that too. See, as we preach and proclaim God's word, we preach and proclaim God's word and what he's doing with us. That's why we talk about 
rightly dividing the word of truth. God didn't save you to make you a king and a priest on the earth. <laughs> he saved you to make you a part of the heavenly kingdom and rule and reign up there according to the grace that was given to Paul. And so Jesus Christ, the, the silver, the redeemer, the purchaser, the one that gave himself, that accomplished and made it all possible. And the one to whom God is going to glorify himself in, in heaven and in earth. He, that's why he says, verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence in the earth, through a kingdom, vested in the nation of Israel, sitting and ruling and reigning on a throne in Jerusalem, and all things in the heavens too. Wow! <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's wonderful. Gold is God the Father and His plan. Silver is God the Son and His redemption, His cross work, His deliverer for Israel as the Messiah, for the body of Christ as the head of the church. Now what about those precious stones? Okay, who's left? The Trinity. You know what precious stones are? Go, go, go back to the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 3. You know what precious stones are? They're for beauty. They're for adornment. Um, First Chronicles chapter 29. I love As David is preparing the materials for this new temple... He has gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver and then brass and iron too. But you know what else he has? Look at um, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 2. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of, God, of my God. What's the, what's the house called? It's the temple. Okay. The gold for the things of gold, made of gold, silver for the things of silver. Brass for the things of brass, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones, and stones to be set, glistering stones of diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones, marble stones in abundance. You know what precious stones, glistering stones, their beauty, what sets the beauty off? light light makes them sparkle makes them stand out it's the beauty of the, uh, the the adornment the priests you know they had stones for glory and for beauty in the book of Exodus and the priest had the, that breastplate with 12 stones that, that had the names of the children of Israel and had 12 stones on the shoulders and the light set them off. And they were for glory and for beauty. And the garb that the priest wore, you know what it did? It set them apart as different. <laughs> they weren't like, you know, all the other people. They were set apart because they had the beautiful adornment. Here are these glistering stones. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. Right, right close there, so you don't have to go too far. And so Solomon now is building the temple. Verse 5, and, and the greater house he sealed with the fir tree and overlaid with fine gold. See, the gold always covers the wood. <laughs> um, fine gold and sat upon the palm trees and chains, and he garnished the house. You know what that word garnished means? It means adorned. It means he dressed it up. He garnished the house with precious stones for what? For beauty. The precious stones are, are the things that you see for beauty and it's, they're set off by the light. And it creates the beauty and the accent here in the things of the house. God and the Holy Spirit, go, now go to Ephesians. This is the passage that we read you know, it's, it's not enough to just know the plan of God. And it's not enough just to, to know what Jesus Christ did. There needs to be 
something that makes that plan and the work visible. Make it stand out and make it be seen. You know what God the Holy Spirit's role is? God the Holy Spirit takes the plan and takes the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and makes it real and visible in the lives of God's people. God the Holy Spirit is the great link between man and God. Do you know that? God, His Spirit communicates with our spirit. It's the Spirit that gave us the life of Jesus Christ, right? God infuses the Spirit and gives us the life. And it's God the Holy Spirit that adorns the life of a believer. God the Holy Spirit is the workhorse of the Trinity. God had the plan. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? But who really, who really created all things? He created all things by Christ Jesus, right? You know what it says about the Spirit in Genesis 1? It says the Spirit of God moved <laughs> upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God is the energy. It's the catalyst. It's the thing that activates and makes the life visible in our life. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not once be once named among you as what? Becometh saints. You know that stuff there, the fornication, the uncleanness and covetousness, that doesn't make the saints look good. You know, it's not becoming to you and I as saints of the body of Christ, does it? Where the fornication, the all uncleanness, let it not be once named among you, neither foolishness nor foolish talking or jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Where does all that stuff come from? Go, go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. But the works of the flesh are manifest. How does the flesh manifest itself? <laughs> with these things here. The flesh is your humanness, right? And where does your humanness produces something that is seen? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, envyings, murders, all that stuff, where does it originate? In your flesh, right? Your flesh produces all this stuff that's unbecoming to a saint. It's not who he, it makes you look bad. <laughs> but what does he say there in verse 22? But the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. <laughs> you see, all that stuff is internal. The Spirit of God produces that where? In your inner man. But what does it do? It works itself out and it's seen in your life. God the Holy Spirit takes the truth of God's Word and produces fruit. Fruit is what you see. Right? And God the Holy Spirit takes the truth and it, it, it adorns the life of believers and it makes it visible. And God is manifest in our flesh. You see how all that, how that works? God the Father, the plan. God the Son, I'll accomplish it. But God the Holy Spirit is the thing that takes it and makes it energy makes it seen in our life. And he works his power in the inner man. Go to Romans. Go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter... 
Romans, Romans, I'm sorry, Romans 8. Romans 8 is all about the Spirit. By the way, isn't the Spirit that which produces the spiritual life to start with? Okay. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You know what that is? That's regeneration. That's God imparting his life when we believe the gospel. And the Spirit of God comes in and regenerates us and gives us his life. The Spirit of God gives us spiritual life. But look at Romans 8.11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. How? <clears throat> By his Spirit that dwelleth in you. <laughs> What is it that now that's inside of us that takes Jesus Christ and God the Father and God's will and God's word and makes it visible? It's God the Holy Spirit that takes and energizes and works in us and produces life, the life of Jesus Christ that God also placed in us. But it's the Spirit of God that, that, that we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. And the Spirit communicates with our spirit. And His Spirit is the link between God and us that helps us understand, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How is that possible? The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. But we've received the Spirit which is of God. You see how all the Trinity works there? And God the Holy Spirit is the, is the energy that, that takes the life and makes the life visible and adorned in our life. And it's God the Holy Spirit that produces the life of Jesus Christ and makes it visible in your life and my life. And how does God do that? He does it with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word in the hands of the Spirit of God produces the life of God. That's how you got saved. You believed the words of God. You trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and He gave you His life. And now, as we take the Word of God, living words, right? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we take, and as we believe that Spirit, that word, that message, God creates energy in us. And He creates the fruit of the Spirit. And it's inside out. We sang this song. Out of my life may Jesus Christ shine. How does, he, how does that happen? The Spirit of God does that. And takes the Word of God and works in us and produces the life of Jesus Christ in us. Sum it all up because we've got to quit. All three are involved in the prophetic program, are they not? God had a plan that he, that he revealed. Jesus Christ says, yes, I'll come in the fullness of the time and I was come made of a woman made under the law. He says in Hebrews, a body you prepared for me. And he came and he did the will of the Father. God the Holy Spirit had a ministry there to make that visible and real. That was the new covenant Pentecostal spiritual blessing, wasn't it? The energy and the power that was, that was manifest there. All three had a role to fill and to fulfill. Is that what God is doing today in our life? See, when we talk about building and edifying and building that building and building that truth in us, it's not building Israel's program with God's plan for the earth. It, and it's not, it's not the redemption that Jesus Christ... That functions in a different way, in a different realm. And it's not the new covenant Pentecostal power because it functions in a different way at a different time. There's no, there's no juice in that battery today. <laughs> you can go get that battery and you can plug it in, but that's not what God's doing today is it? But we take the grace that was given to Paul it was the hidden wisdom of the Father 
and it was the work of God the Son to be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Same cross work, expanded purpose, expanded role for expanded people. Gentiles? Gen we, we use that Jew-Gentile thing. The, gent the apostle of the Gentiles, that is such a radical statement in the Bible. God is now manifesting his life in the Gentiles? And it's, the, and it's not the Pentecostal New Covenant work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit according to the grace given to Paul. And you know what? In our life, as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we need all three elements working in our life. The Father's plan, the Son's work and redemption, and the Holy Spirit's energy. And when we do that, he says back in 1 Corinthians, let's go back there and we'll quit. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Well, really, 10, 11, and 12. The grace given to Paul, the message, the purpose, the plan. Now if any man, verse 12, build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones. There's no ore in it. You need all three to be fully functioning as a believer. You need, to, you need to understand the Father's plan. You need to understand the Son's work. <laughs> and you need the Holy Spirit's energy working in your life. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. That's the graduation. And God is going to measure the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that's been built into our lives. And it's going to demonstrate for him and for us the, the role that we'll fill out there in the ages to come. And we get the reward. Every man's going to receive a reward. Verse 14, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. This is not salvation, is it? This is service and standing and walk. Our life before the Lord matters because it's going to come up for review. And what's been built into our lives and what's been manifest because God wants to be visible here on the earth. You know how he's visible today? Through his body. And you're his hands, his feet, his mouth, his ears, you're supposed to be listening, but you're supposed to be speaking. Got two ears, one mouth. Listen to him, but, but speak it. Out of my life, may Jesus shine. Amen? In a new way. It all starts with the gospel. We trust Jesus as our personal Savior. And then live in the reality of who we are today. Amen? Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at these things. And the, um, the, the plan that you revealed and the work of your Son... <laughs> And then the provision for it to become a reality in our life is all laid before us. And there's a complete revelation before us that reveals your hidden plan and your hidden wisdom and purpose and your desire to make the Lord Jesus Christ manifest in a Gentile world. We thank you that we're a part of that. Lord, we pray that we would build into our lives the things that would, that would reflect and... and uh, uh, Make beauty and put beauty on display, the beauty of our Savior. Make it manifest and adornment and that which is becoming to the saints of God that we are. That people might see Him and not us. Lord, we thank you for this great privilege and for the, the ministry that we have. And we pray that uh, we would build into our lives th those things that, um, that would enhance our testimony and make known your Son in this dark world. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.